Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole. And on today's episode, we're focusing on autism and related disorders. And you'll be hearing from the mother of a now adult son with ASD about their journey and how it changed her perspective on what's really important when it comes to treatment and support for um, kids and adults with autism spectrum disorder. So much of the autism treatment world is focused on behavioral training. And you know how I feel about that if you've listened to any previous episodes of the show. What we really need is a developmental understanding of what's going on with kids who have these brain-based issues and a therapeutic approach that focuses on relationships and regulation. So I'm very excited to have my friend and colleague, Sue Simmons, on the show today to have this conversation. Let me tell you a little bit about Sue. She is on a mission to change the way our society views and addresses autism. For decades, frazzled parents of autistic children have waited anxiously for treatment, feeling helpless and dependent. Sue proposes a new paradigm armed with training and knowledge. Not only are parents able to make dramatic changes in their children's lives, but they are ideally suited to do so. Her refreshing approach puts parents back in the driver's seat with a focus on building safe emotional relationships rather than only seeking compliance. The results are clear, real change is possible, and parents hold the key. Sue, you know that I could not agree with that more. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Oh my gosh, Nicole. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you and I can't wait to have this juicy conversation. (laughs) It's going to be great. I've been looking forward to it because of course you and I have known each other for a long time now. And I think it's so important for um, families, uh, especially if they are perhaps newer in the process mm-hmm. of having mm-hmm. a child with challenges, you know, getting a diagnosis, figuring out what to do. It's important for them to hear the stories like what you're going to talk with us about today and to just hear the lived experience yeah. of yeah. parents and families who have been down this path. So, so grateful that you're willing to share. Um, and let's really start out by having you talk about your experience as a parent. Mm-hmm. You know, your son is now 24. Yes, um, he is. And so yeah. I'd love for you to just share with everybody um, sort of a summary of that journey for you with him. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, it's a tough story to tell on many levels, but it's a really important one. You know, when I, um, I, I wanted to be a mom, like I was, I knew I wanted to be a mom because I wanted to do it in a way so that I could have the relationship with my children that I couldn't have with my own mom. Mm -hmm. My mom was um, uh, untreated bipolar. Mm -hmm. And so it was a pretty crazy upbringing. So I was all set to be the mom that I always dreamt Mm -hmm. I wanted to be. So um, my son was born, everything seemed to be going along just fine. And it just a little bit after his third birthday, everything just went sideways. It was, it was, it almost felt to me like, you know, he had, my child had been abducted and another put in his place. And out of nowhere, um, he became um, very solitary. He did not want to do anything with me. Like we played together all the time. He was really into Hot Wheels. Hmm. And so instead of making the track with me, he wanted to line them up. And I couldn't get involved. I couldn't insert myself in play. It became a massive power struggle every single time. And I was petrified. You know, what happened to my happy little boy? Mm -hmm. Um, He was controlling. I couldn't, I was walking on eggshells in my own home. And now I've heard the story hundreds of times Mm -hmm. from other moms, right? But at that time, I was still a fairly new mom. Mm -hmm. I was living in a in a new city. And I didn't have a lot of friends in the area. I didn't really have any support. My mom was certainly no help. Mm -hmm. And and of course, my my then husband, I'm separated now, um, thought that it was something I was doing. Mm oh my gosh, like, it was, it was like putting salt in a wound. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. So of course, you know, I'm pretty resourceful. And and I was determined to figure out what was going on. So of course, you know, we started going for, you know, 
consults here and there. And I got told that I loved him too much, Mm -hmm. that I was, I was spoiling him. Mm -hmm. You know, it just went on and on. And finally, it took us two years Mm -hmm. to get a diagnosis. And he wasn't diagnosed until 2001. So we're going back Mm -hmm. a number of years. And um, I was like every day. I mean, I'm not a yeller by nature. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a generally a very calm individual Mm -hmm. not so much then let me tell you I turned in to what felt like a beast Mm -hmm. the it was the only thing I knew Mm -hmm. how to do and of course we know that this is what it's like for parents that have not had or been given Mm -hmm. information that is like accurate yes and and so I I mean our house was madness Mm -hmm. In fact, my, my then husband, Jeff would come home and he would jokingly call me Alice at the end of the day, because I had mascara running down my face. Now there might be listeners who are, (laughs) don't remember Alice Cooper, (laughs) but I sure do. And so how can you, how, how do you think that made me feel at the end of a hard day where I was tearing my hair out every Mm -hmm. moment and he would come home and go, Hey, Alice, how's Mm -hmm. it going? Yeah. Yeah. It was tough. It was really tough. He had, he was unable to be supportive and I don't fault him. You know, he turns out he's on the spectrum Mm -hmm. and um, he didn't get it. He, and so we finally got our diagnosis from the center for addiction and mental health in Toronto in 2001. And when the psychologist said autism, it was such early days that, you know, my son was the first diagnosed in our area you could have knocked me over with a feather. Mm -hmm. And I remember driving home from getting the diagnosis and I called my mom. Why? I don't know. (laughs) But, but you know, when her, she said to me, well, it's not going to kill him. And, you know, very helpful. Thanks mom. Um, Well, it, it almost did. Mm -hmm. And, and it, uh, it almost did on more than one occasion. So, you know, it was just, it was a nightmare. And I remember at one point, you know, really questioning whether my life was worth living, Mm -hmm. you know, could I do this? Was I going to be the parent? Could I be the parent that I wanted to be that I vowed, Mm -hmm. vowed to give both of my kids a good life and I bloody well will. But Mm -hmm. back then, let me tell you, I, I was a mess. Mm -hmm. And I, a girlfriend came over, she drove two hours to see me stood me in front of the mirror and said look at yourself you know how can you possibly be a parent to these you know at that time I had my daughter too how can you be a parent to these two kids you know like would you put them on a plane with a pilot in your condition like come on like give your head a shake Mm -hmm. and that's when I really realized but you know what the night before that this is such I don't tell the story very often Mm -hmm we lived on a lake and I paddled my canoe out to the middle of the lake Mm -hmm. in the dark without a life preserver. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there and I debated, what should I do? And that was such a turning point for me. I sat there and I sat there and I could just tip this thing, you know, and, uh, and I don't know, by the grace of God, I, I have no idea how it happened, but I, something told me, yeah. you know, you're on this planet to do good work and to be a mom, mm-hmm. the mom you want to be. So I paddled that canoe back in. My girlfriend came the next day and I went, all right, all right. I got to, you know, it's got to start with me. If I don't start looking after myself, my kids are going down the tubes, mm-hmm. both of them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, after that day, I really began to see things differently. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that it had to start with my own self care. I had to get my SHIT together. (laughs) And right, and I had to start doing things for me before them, because I became this, this vindictive, resentful martyr Mm -hmm. person thing, Mm -hmm. you know, I was unrecognizable to myself. I'm so appreciative of you sharing that though, because I know that there are so many parents listening who can relate Mm -hmm. to that. And we don't talk about 
no. the realness of that enough. And people feel like, oh, I'm the only one that feels that way. And so for exactly. you to share that is so, um, so vulnerable and so powerful because it helps other people, moms in particular, who often mm-hmm. are the ones bearing the majority of the burden of this to know yes. that, wow, I am not alone. Wow. I have felt that way and I'm not the yeah. only one. And I think there's there's a community around that that's needed because, mm-hmm. you know, you and I hear those stories from parents day in and day out when they get yes. to know us enough to trust us and to be vulnerable and share those, yes. those moments, like you just said, of having to make a big decision about, am I going to do this or am I not? And how is this going to go? And, but, but people don't talk about that. And in fact, I no. think that a lot of women in particular Um, they're scared to even communicate that because there is so much shame and blame that society, you know, puts on women in particular, moms in particular around, what do you mean you could ever feel that way about your kid? Or what do you mean, you know, you would consider not being there for them? Well, these are the very real things that come up, especially when you have a child who you just really feel like, I, I don't think I can do this. I don't yes. know how to get through another day. I don't have the support or the resources or the tools to do this. And it can yeah. just feel completely overwhelming. And so I'm so grateful to you for, for sharing your story in that way, for people to just know that they're not alone. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And and you're so right. It's like a taboo subject, you yes. know, that we, and I, you know, one of the things that I think is so important as a woman to communicate and now as a professional, obviously, that, you know, the way our system is working, if we reverse the roles, Mm -hmm. if we put men in the role of women now, Mm -hmm. do you think that they would have been okay with how they have been treated by our system? I don't think so. Right. Yep. So I think this is, uh, you know, there's, there's an equality piece here too that really you know has not been touched on at all yeah but you know back to that vulnerability like you're right like people like I I um I have women in in groups who can and and there are some amazing dads there too and let's be honest here we need more of these incredible dads at the table for sure um but it's not until a woman feels safe enough Mm -hmm. to open up and say oh my god I feel the very same way. And then it's like the floodgate opens Mm -hmm. and everyone just like the tears start flowing and they can finally feel validated that their experience is exactly what so many other moms feel. And my heart goes out to these women who don't feel like they have a place where they can feel safe. Mm -hmm. That's right. And express yeah, but and there's a but they there's a, a like kind of a a, a double edged sword there. You don't want the the, the whiny thing right. coming out right. either because that's counterproductive. That's right. Yeah. Right. It just right. we we just misery loves company. That's a slippery slope. Right. For sure. And and I want to you know I want to be clear here because I think um, one of the things that can happen when a parent is vulnerable and expresses how they are really feeling about being the parent of a child with significant needs and and trying to manage all that, we now have this unfortunate situation where some parts of the neurodiversity community swoop in and say, how horrible of you like to, you know, how can you say that you're, you know, feeling overwhelmed and terrible, just love your child for who they are. You know, if you're expressing that you're frustrated or overwhelmed or, you know, upset, then that means you're not accepting of your kid and nothing could be further from the truth. And I want to be clear about that because Sue, if there's one thing I know about you, you are very much in the camp of embracing and celebrating neurodiversity of celebrating both of your kids for who they are and how their brains were made and function. And that doesn't mean that it isn't also sometimes really overwhelming, frustrating, you know, trying to be the parent to someone who has these challenges. And I think we need to recognize 
that both of those things can and do exist at the same time. Yeah. The yeah. parent expressing overwhelm, frustration, grieving has mm-hmm. nothing to do with not embracing and honoring who mm-hmm. their child is. And, and I'm curious your thoughts yeah. on that because I see that happening more and more. Yes. Yes. And I have experienced that too, where, you know, I, post something on social yeah. media and I get all these comments back and it's like, you don't understand everyone's entitled to their views yeah. and opinions. Yeah. Like, and that applies to everyone yeah. on the That's planet. Right. right. But, but at the same time, like our kids are suffering. Yeah. Our kids are suffering. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, this isn't about changing who they are. It's about cultivating their strengths yeah. That's right. and, and allowing their gifts to emerge so that they can, you know, use those gifts in this world that needs them so desperately. And, and so like, you know, I, I love to be able to see a parent feel more empowered, feel more connected with their child, realize that they are the right person to do the doing and, and to, to just, to really experience the joy of seeing that sparkle really come to the surface, you know, so that, so that they can, they can see that their child has all of the gifts that any other human child does. Right. But, but be able to know that they were the ones who lovingly in baby steps with the most compassion, Mm -hmm. playfulness and authenticity, Mm -hmm. you know, bring out that little soul's gifts and it's, it's magic like it's really it feels like magic to me every time it, it is and and it took time for you to get there right because I'm oh, you yeah. know, I know when your child first gets diagnosed with autism especially in 2001 Yep. Nobody was swooping in to tell you right away about a relationship-based developmental approach, right? So can you talk a little bit about <laughs> what your experience was around the whole thing of what do we do about this now? Because I know that was quite a winding journey and really oh. you personally and professionally to find something that works better than what is prescribed Yes, you know, traditionally, when, when a child gets this diagnosis, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So that's a that's a good question. So um, we got the diagnosis. And um, I was not really given, you know, I'll tell you what I was given. I was given the name of a parent mm-hmm. to connect with. Mm-hmm. And uh, the name of a doctor who I eventually became very good friends with, but at that time, who was, of course, prescribing what we know to be our behavior, behavioral approach to autism. And, uh, you know, it just did not sit right with me. It's like, this is my child. And you want me to, to what? And, and, and that's going to do what? Like, so here I am. I'm not like, I, I, I wanted to be a mom. Like I want to be a mom. I don't want to be like, the dropper off of this child, right? So I didn't go that route. What I did instead is I started a support group. Mm -hmm. And at that time, this was like the dawn of the internet back when the dinosaurs ruled. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) some of us were around for that. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I know. And so um, it was crazy because I started collecting email addresses, right? And so I started this group. Sorry, but my dogs are barking. Um, it was the first of its kind in our area. It's still running now. I'm not involved with it, but um, at any road, at any, um, any. So we had like parents coming in throngs mm-hmm. because there wasn't a place for them to go to feel understood, like we were already talking about. And we had 40 people. Mm-hmm. It was in a church basement. Mm-hmm. So I'd go in, make the coffee, chair the meetings, right? <laughs> I yep. did all that. And then one day a parent came in with a brochure mm-hmm. and it was a very thick brochure. And um, so I asked if I could have a look at it. And it was for a parent-based program that it was developmentally focused. Mm-hmm. So it was all about understanding how the that child's neurology is is different and that that child experiences the world in a different way. They are frustrated, they're overwhelmed, they're misunderstood and that parents are the best ones 
to learn how to parent this child. And I, so I just grabbed that thing and okay, I'm all over it. Mm -hmm. And so that, as we know, uh, was the relationship development intervention approach, which you and I were both trained in way back. And um, that's how we met. Mm -hmm. And so I discovered the first Canadian to be certified um, lived very close to me, Mm. like ironically 20 minutes away. Mm. So I, glommed on to this woman <laughs> I'm sure she saw me coming and was like oh no <laughs> oh no what are these <laughs> so I said to my husband this is what we're doing and um the rest is history like it, you know there's a lot of understanding to be done right yes. because that's the biggest issue as I see it is parents are not told no. In this information, in fact, I don't think I've ever met maybe one parent who came to me with the understanding of how their child's development development was, you know, what was for all intents and purposes just thwarted, mm-hmm. right? How that impacted their ability to parent their child. I mean, no one knows this stuff. And so okay. these poor parents out there are thinking, it's all my fault. That's right. And I'm a bad mom. That the solution is, as you said, you know, well, we prescribe you, you know, 20 to 40 hours a week of applied behavior analysis, where guess what, you turn your child over to someone who has a high school diploma, maybe a college diploma, no training in child development, neurology, but training in behavioral compliance. And turn your kid over to this person or this group of people, and they're going to quote unquote, fix your kid. And it's so disempowering for parents and it you're so right it leaves a parent going okay well clearly like I'm being told by the professionals that I have nothing to offer my child I am not an important part of their life or development and my role becomes making sure that the behavior techs and these other people who know better are managing my kid all the time and it's not only is it incredibly damaging for the child Yes. And for those of you listening, if you missed the episode with um, Greg Santucci, where he and I really get into the big, big problems with applied behavior analysis, ABA, and other types of approaches similar to that, go back and listen to that. But for the purpose of our conversation here, Sue, what really becomes problematic, I think, there is it's completely disempowering to parents. And oh it says gosh. you have nothing to offer your child you, you know, you are not part of this equation. And here's the thing, it leaves them with no understanding and no skills when it comes to living with their child and, and, and being a parent to their child, which is like insane. It's, I know it's like, (laughs) I, I, I did a, um, a Facebook live once and I, I, um, I had a visual of a and then B. So A is this family, like of stick people. This was what I drew, right? And there's arrows pointing at the child, right? About 15 different arrows. Your child needs this, 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 this. Your child is a problem. A set of problems to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And so the mother is wearing the chauffeur hat and the dad is standing over sideline going like, what? (laughs) Right. And it, you know, hopefully that's changing. And, and so the mother, the whole family's being, you know, stressed to the nines, the siblings are feeling resentful. Of course, the mom's feeling more guilt, more guilt, and even more guilt. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing enough of it? Right. And then B the different, you know, the sort of after picture is, you know, first of all, the mom feels understood, validated, you know, her stress is acknowledged and address, addressed. And she, it's quite likely that she may have experienced PTSD. Yes. Uh, because we know, I think it's somewhere in the vicinity of 20% or thereabouts, uh, num- that percentage of moms experience PTSD. We know their children have been traumatized. There's no question, you know, these, these kids have vulnerable nervous systems at the best of times. They are unable to regulate their emotions. They're overwhelmed. We know that be, their outward behavior is a manifestation of their internal experience, right? And so now, you know, we know now that parents are the most important people in their child's lives, no matter what. Mm-hmm. 
And we know now the research uh, is saying that for any child to have quality of life, to have the best life possible, they need to have that emotionally safe and connected relationship with at least one parent and caregiver. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, how many children out there who have neurodevelopmental challenges have that? Right. Right. That's the scary thing. You know, what happens to these kids? That's right. You know, well, because we're not approaching them and, and these families in a way that prioritizes that. And that, that I think is the big missed opportunity, you know, treatment becomes about other people doing things with your kid and not about helping the family yeah. to, be able to regulate, to function well, to thrive. And that's really where all of the important positive benefits happen. And we're seeing the research come out about that for sure. Yes. Um, but the fact that, as you said, the vast majority of parents aren't even being told that, hey, yeah. it's going to be important for you to understand and, and learn about what is going on, you know, yeah. with your child's brain, what's going on beneath these behaviors to have some skills for this. Oh um, my even gosh. in some of the, the parent training classes and things that are offered, the focus is very much on a reward and punishment based yep. system here, you Absolutely. know, put together these charts and, you know, give these rewards. Oh, and it just I remember doing that. It was crazy, like, right. You just go, I, oh my gosh, I have to manage 17 charts and stickers all day. Like, oh, like you need a, you need, um, uh, what am I thinking? Project management That's right. training, right? <laughs> exactly. To be able to stay on top of, you know, yeah. reward, you know, consequence, yeah. reward, reward. It's just yeah. like, it's too much and it's not realistic. Yeah. And, you know, we, I mean, let's not go there. We just know they don't work. That's right. And so yeah. let's talk a bit about what does work because I've always thought it's so strange. And right at the time when you were going through this as a parent with your son was the time I was going through this professionally, having yeah. been in the field of working with kids with autism for several years and going, most of this doesn't make sense to me. And mm -hmm. I don't want to get more training in these other approaches. Like there's got to be some other way, which is when I found, you know, relationship development yep. intervention from the professional standpoint, when you were discovering it yep. from a personal standpoint. But what struck me so much about that, you know, I had been trained through my training in education um, and child development about child development and child brain development and how that process un unfolds. And what was so weird to me when I came to the world of autism was there was no discussion or even awareness or prioritization of child development for these kids. And I'm like, but these are kids too. Like if anything for a child with a vulnerable neurological system, we should be even more focused on yes. that developmental process. And oh, yet no. that has been largely absent but of course you found, you know, approaches and ways to prioritize that. So let's talk about what were some of the pivotal things or what are some of the things that you think from a developmental perspective that parents need to understand or that need to be done differently? Yeah, yeah, good question. So I think the first thing is the understanding piece, right? That, that we know our children's development has been, has been halted at a certain point. Um, I think now, you know, with this word neuroplasticity is everywhere, right? I remember when I was in Houston doing training and my colleagues and I were passing around books and there was a book that came out at that time. It was called Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. And it was like, we were all sitting there going, oh my God, the brain can change, the brain can change. So how do we do this, right? Well, we have to give our children different experiences than the ones they're getting, right? So we have to understand that their nervous system you know, thanks to Dr. Stephen Porges and the polyvagal theory, we know that now we understand that that so much of what autism really looks like really matches up with autonomic uh, dysfunction, right? And, and so, system, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that that I am so crazy about right now is um, sort of like looking at mom's stress. Mm -hmm understanding her behavior, her natural behavioral style, because that informs how she's going to show up with her children when she's under stress. So helping her understand how her mind and body works, 
right? And that's where emotional freedom techniques comes in for me mm -hmm. uh, because it's just a phenomenal uh, trauma-informed tool that allows me to help her calm her nervous system and understand how her mind works, understand how what she's thinking is going to inform how she's going to show up. Because mm -hmm. if we see this child as being a little pill yeah. and trying to, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, turn the, turn the screw, right. Then we're going to show up as that beast that right. I used to show up as. Right. But once we understand that our child is suffering mm -hmm. and that they are a little human being, mm -hmm. not a Martian, right. they are a little human being who needs and deserves mm -hmm. compassion mm -hmm. and love, no matter what, no matter what has happened, mm -hmm. this child is not, you know, having a good time here you know trying to turn their parents life upside down they need compassion and so when we can come together and just be be together be together without trying to get something from our child you know to 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 sort of embrace what the child's interests are and engage with that as a starting point mm -hmm to learn to do things together that are like, you know, gardening or things that we can do. Now, parents need help with this, right? Because if it was that easy, they'd already be doing it. Right, of course. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but, and then on the other side, understanding that child's nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I am in love with the Safe and Sound Protocol, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, developed by Dr. Stephen Porges and Integrated Listening Systems Unite. I have seen incredible things happen, like just with the child's brain and body being able to relax even a little bit makes such a tremendous difference. Their, their social engagement system is able to come online, mm -hmm. you know, and then we've got all the gut issues, digestive challenges, all of those things too. So, so we look at, I look at it from, you know, the mom's stress and where she is, the child's stress and where they are what is the child's strengths yeah let's look at this from a strength-based perspective and celebrate what that child is good at celebrate what they're interested in mm -hmm. like i've got one family i'm thinking about right now whose child you know could work for nasa in like mm -hmm. five years and he's six right <laughs> like, <laughs> no they're not all the same we know that everyone on this planet is unique and deserves to be celebrated for who they are but to so we've got to look at everything differently we've got to question everything mm -hmm. we've got to support the caregivers mm -hmm. and give them the tools and and the self-understanding that that they need in order to be able to manage their own emotions mm -hmm. and to have support so that they can say you know oh my gosh, today is a really bad day. And you know what? That's okay. You're allowed to have bad days. This is not about being the perfect mom. There's no such thing in the first place. Yeah. Right? I think what this really gets at from a developmental perspective that most people, you know, they, they know um, just because they've been a child and now are an adult, but that hasn't yeah. been explicitly pointed out to them is that children develop through their relationships with yes. other people. Yeah. Thank you. I, Child I, yeah. brain development happens through what we call and, and what the field of child development called guided participation, right? Yep. The yep. parent being a supportive, but sturdy leader and guide to the yes. child. And what we know happens in autism and related kinds of disorders, special needs in general, that guided participation relationship gets disrupted, right? Where yeah, parents are, you know, the child isn't being a, an easy to lead, uh, you know, participant. <laughs> and as the parent, you just go, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. Like it totally throws off your compass yeah. Of how to engage with kids. And I think that's, you know, so beautifully illustrated in the story that you told about your own experience early on as a mom, you were mm -hmm. like, I'm going to be the best mom. I'm going to spend all this time with my kid. And you were doing this and, and suddenly the compass got thrown off and you were like, I'm doing mm -hmm. all these things to try to guide and engage my child. And my child is going Ooh, totally over here. And yeah. it's like that compass just spins and you go, I don't know how to engage and and help this child participate with me and with life and and so I think that's what we're really talking about right that the key yeah. is helping parents learn how to manage their side of that 
in yeah. a way that then allows kids to be guided and to engage yeah. in the things that move their brain development forward. Exactly. Um, and, you yeah. know, you said something there that I think um, bears repeating. So like one of the things that it's very complicated, but so simple at the same time, right? When we show up differently, our child shows up differently in response. Mm -hmm. And that's the beginning yeah. of, of being able to lead our child's, um, or guide our child's thinking and emotional and social and cognitive development, right? And so once parents start to see that, mm -hmm. you know, if I show up with compassion mm -hmm. instead of screaming and yelling, mm -hmm. wow, what a difference that makes. Like, boom, mm -hmm. it's so quick and things can turn around yeah. really, really like surprisingly quickly. Mm -hmm. And what does that tell you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does it tell you, right? That this, this child wants, mm -hmm wants to be loved, you know, wants to love. I mean, this is how human beings are, are made, right? We need relationships in our lives. It's, it's like, you know, without having that one um, emotionally connected relationship, that child is as good as like a kite in the air without, mm -hmm. you know, tethered. That's right. They're not grounded. They, they can't be in the world without being able to relate to other people mm -hmm. and it's the parents um, it's the parents um, gift mm -hmm. to be able to bring that out in their child and, and I sort of I see myself as a facilitator yeah. of that process mm -hmm. you know so just baby steps baby steps it's all about baby steps right and um, it really is it, it's so empowering for moms to realize that I am the right person to be doing this all along. I thought I was the worst mom ever, but now I see I have a role in my child's life and I want to be able to see that child's life uh, blossom. Mm -hmm. And so that when I'm not here, I feel that I've done everything I could and that I have I have confidence in my child's ability to zig and zag in the world, right? Now that takes a lot of, you know, it, it's not a quick fix, right? No. But as, you know, our Dr. G says, it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's right. And um, it couldn't be farther th from the truth, but it's, is it worth it? Right. Ho, 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 you bet. That's right. Absolutely. And it is that, I think taking that marathon perspective is so valuable because it takes the pressure yeah. off from one day to the next of having to exactly. get everything quote unquote fixed or managed right away. It's like, okay, yeah. it's going to be a process. And, and I want to, I want to touch on something just to be clear, because I think one of the things that gets misunderstood when we're talking about child development focused and parent focused intervention, there's a misunderstanding on the part of some people that we're blaming parents for the child's issues that, oh, you're doing parent-focused intervention while well, you're t saying that yeah. it's the parent's fault and oh. nothing could be further from the truth. No, I think oh my gosh. Touching on because that oh, is unfortunately yes. a stigma around this that, you know, you and I have both yep. heard. Yeah, absolutely. In 2017, I did a very informal survey. So I want to make sure I emphasize the word in, informal <laughs> and I, because I was creating a program. So I interviewed over a hundred moms and most of those moms, children had already done their, you know, allotment of therapy. And so, you know, how are you doing? You know, how, how are you feeling? Your child's had their therapy. What's the outcome? It didn't do anything, or no, I shouldn't say that. Like many parents said, this is better, this is better. But as a mom, I just feel like the underbelly of a snake, yeah. you know, and, and it's not their fault. And that's the thing, right? If you think, oh, this therapy is going to, you know, you know, once we get this over with, we are good to go. Yep. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. And these moms internalized it mm -hmm. because that, well, that was supposed to work and it didn't. So it's got to be me. It's yeah. not your fault if you're a mom listening here. Yeah. It is not your fault. The, it couldn't be farther from the truth. And you need to know that. 
Yeah. And I think that when we're talking about focusing on parents as the key to intervention, it's not because there's blame. It's because you hold the key. We know that child brain development happens via the relationships with parents and primary caregivers. So the focus is on you as the parents, not because anything is your fault, but because you do hold an important key. And so I really try to frame it for people um, in terms of empowerment of, look, this is such a wonderful thing that you don't need to be dependent on Mm -hmm. other people to do something with your child to make things better. You can develop. Um, you know, the the ability to do this. And when parents can learn how to understand and guide their child in those more productive ways, everybody has a better life, not just the child, but the family, the entire family, the the parents, the siblings, you know, everybody. And that's really the beautiful part of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's so true. And, you know, I I see just um, last week having a, a, a really amazing conversation with a a couple, you know, at home, right, both parents work, two young children, the one on the spectrum, like, you know, not uh, maybe a year apart. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine these kids are at each other all the time, right? Parents are trying to work. It life is, you know, mayhem, right? Mayhem. Well, a couple of months, three months in, different picture altogether, different picture all together. Mm -hmm. And even the, you know, some of this, some of the friction between the two little guys Mm -hmm. is, is, uh, has calmed way down. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's happier, you know, so it's just, and and then there's the sort of, I mean, economic aspect. Yes. (laughs) Holy cow. Like, let's talk about how we can throw money away. You know, and, and I, everyone's, and I want to make a point that all you know, all people that work in this field want to do good things. So I I just, it's so important to say that because I don't want anyone to think, well, she's bashing us. It's not that, you know, you're doing the best, you know, you're doing the work you want to be doing with the information you have, you're trying to do your best, right? Um, But yeah, it, it truly does change the whole family dynamics. And, and I see the pride in the faces of parents who have it's it's taking a leap of faith yeah Yeah. it really is you know and 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 there's a lot of fear involved for parents like i'm thinking of one of my clients sam who um just amazing woman who had uh you know very just disciplinarian upbringing so of course she's going to parent the way she was parented that's all we know right and um you know, it it took time, but she began to realize how much she was sabotaging herself Mm -hmm. through her thinking. And more and more and more and more yelling is not going to make things better. And so, you know, she was, she benefited tremendously from EFT and, and they since graduated, you know, they, um, I worked myself out of a job. And just to see them feeling like sure they, they're going to have bad days you know that's inevitable that's life but at the same time Sam has sort of in her mind she has a little rundown of okay so like what can I be doing here or how am I looking at this mm-hmm. you know because how we see how we perceive something is how we address it and so it's it's just been life-changing for her to know like She's said on a couple of um, of Facebook lives with me, like, I never thought I could do this because she herself suffered from mental health challenges as, let's be honest, as so many moms do, right? And so that goes back to that, you know, vulnerability piece. These moms need to know that they're not alone. And Sam was like, Sam was just like any other mom. She felt she had so much um, self-loathing that you know she it it took a lot of of um fortitude fortitude for her to say yeah okay i'm doing this yeah Yeah. but today it's a different family and it just oh my god what a feeling to know that this can happen i love it 
Yeah. As we're getting ready to wrap up here, I would love for you just to briefly share with everybody, you know, we talked to you about the early part of your journey with your son and, and him getting diagnosed and how you picked a different um, treatment path. I'd love for you, if you're willing, just to share um, a, a little bit about what he's up to today. Oh, I love this part. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it, it, there were many valleys and many ups and many downs. And um, there were many times I didn't know whether he would still be here today. Um, he struggled with depression and a very difficult depression and, um, you know, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts. However, um, in his late teens, um, we did do a little bit of work with you, which was, um, which was unbelievably fabulous. And, um, you know, he had a therapist that, that, that got him into mindfulness. And um, so today he is just finishing up his college degree, um, visual communications and uh, graphic design. He's doing an internship and he's in a committed relationship. And, you know, he has bad days too, right? Um, and that, that's always gonna be there, just part of being alive and, and human being. But he's, you know, for, most, for the most part, he is a lovely human being. And I'm so proud to, um, to say that I had a hand in supporting his growth and development to where he is today. I'm, he's just an exceptional human being. He, he is, and you, you know, touched on his accomplishments, but, um, and it just makes me teary having you. I know. Him. Um, I know. But I think what's the most remarkable is what a, what an incredibly attuned, sensitive, lovely, thoughtful young man he is. He really is. And that all the other things aside, you know, to me as a parent and thinking about, you know, your son and, and everybody who I work with, whether or not they go on to college, whether or not they even are ever able to, you know, have employment or mm -hmm. be out on their own or whatever, all of that aside, to see kids grow up to be lovely kind, yeah. thoughtful, engaged um, human beings. Uh, what a, what a remarkable, what a remarkable oh. thing. And, um, and, yeah. and your son is just a beautiful example of that. Thank you. I tell you, I, I look at him every day. I look at him and think, oh, mm -hmm. I'm so proud of who you are, you know, and, and he, it took a lot of fortitude for him too. Yeah. You know, of course, for like, you. That's right. yeah, yeah, exactly. But it can be done. That's it can right. be done. Right? right. And you're right about that. Like not everyone is going to be able to go on and right. work for NASA or do right. whatever, you know, but, but so many can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And to we've just, got to expect more. You that's know? right. We just have to expect yeah. more. And to focus on helping each of them become the best version of themselves that they can be and that that's yeah. so possible. And, um, and so I so appreciate you um, just sharing your story. And I know that he mm. gives you permission to talk about him. And so I just want to say that too, that yeah. we're talking about yeah. him with his knowledge of the fact yes. that you're sharing about him um, and, you know, appreciate him being willing to, to have that story shared. Yes, as well. yes. So, absolutely. Um, this has been just such a beautiful, wonderful, important conversation. Oh, um, thank you. Sure and I, I want to make sure that people know where they can find out more about the work mm -hmm. that you're doing, the, th the resources and things that you have available. Yes. So Equinox Family Consulting is the website. And I just want to say super fast, the name of the business Equinox I chose because I want to give children on the spectrum an equal opportunity for quality of life as their neurotypical peers. And so that speaks to the Equinox when there's an equal um, length of time and uh, of light and dark, I should say. So um, Equinox Family Consulting, um, uh, there are tons and tons and tons of resources on the website. We also have a Facebook group. Um, it's primarily made of moms. Um, it's called Empowered Parents Navigating Autism. 
And so we have, I don't know, 1500 moms in the group. And um, it's been a little less active with the pandemic. <laughs> I think we can figure out why. Yeah. But but if if you're a mom and you want to be around others who are wanting to have the best life for their child and family, then we would love to have you in our group. And I do Facebook lives on Thursday nights, most weeks. And um, so please connect with me. And I would love to talk to you about what I do and how I can help. Awesome. And we'll put those links in the show notes too. For those of you um, who are interested, you can go grab those off the website or, or go check those out. Lots of wonderful um, resources and supports and things available on Sue's website. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, yeah. Sue, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us yeah. today, to share your story, to share what you're doing. I know it was really valuable for everybody listening. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Nicole. It's been such a treat. And thanks as always to all of you for listening. We'll catch you back here next week for our next episode of the Better Behavior Show.